what do you do if you drop the big bucks on the car of your dreams, you get it home, and then it betrays you, and it keeps betraying you, and you're backwards and forwards to the dealership trying to get it fixed. Ultimately, it spends more time at the dealership than it does out there on the road, turning and burning and cheesing you from ear to ear like they promised it would in the brochure. So your back is against the wall, you demand your money back, they give you a two-word answer, sex and travel, and then you get ready to fix bayonets. How should you play it? I'm John Logan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Australia only. Website. Card. Now, I've got this, I guess you'd call it a cry for help, from a dude like you named Brody Goff. All right? Now, I get these cries for help all the time. This is hardly an outlier. Right? There's got to be thousands of people in Australia at any point in time who are feeling manifestly depressed over issues such as this. So, Brody, here's some edited highlights, okay? Firstly, we love our Isuzu MUX, but so far we've had nothing but trouble with the engine light and gearbox warning lights coming on. I don't get how you can love it in this situation. I, it's betraying you, dude. Come on. The first time it happened at uh, 1,500 odd kilometres, the dealership had it for a week and a half and couldn't fix it. The second time it happened at 2,100 kilometres, the dealership had it for another week and a half and still not fixed. It's now happened for the third time at 4,500 kilometres. We're now being told it's the ECM and the engine control module, I presume. And so far it's been two weeks and we're being told they can't do anything about it without Isuzu approval. We're also told the part is currently at head office here in Brisbane. Even though it's a warranty issue, we are still waiting for approval. You know when I say on and on that Isuzu is one of the worst operators in the business? This is that, okay? Someone like Brody here, he said his car off the road for five weeks. It's like not even 5,000 kilometres old yet. Like, come on. Most people drive 5,000 kilometres in three months. That means if Brody is an average kilometre driver, that his vehicle has been off the road for a third of the time, right? That's disgraceful off the bat. It's disgraceful. We've so far had to cancel three trips to see my sick grandmother and family because of these faults. And the fact is the car is unreliable. We bought a new family car to go away in with our children confidently and safely. So far, we've not been able to do anything with this vehicle. It's currently no better than an $85,000 paperweight. We've completely lost confidence in this vehicle and Isuzu, especially now when everyone knows the part it needs is in Brisbane and we have already waited two weeks without approval and without being able to use our car. It feels like we gave our money to them and now we don't matter as they already have our money. Well, I'd suggest this is exactly what is happening to Brody. Like once you've done the deal, with some car companies you're dead to them or to the extent that you're not dead, you're just uh, a vehicle to use, to use to derive further income from by saying, oh no, that's not warrantable, we'll take this out, that's gonna cost a $300 diagnosis fee or whatever. You are just a cash cow, in other words, for many manufacturers and as much as I like some of the things about the D-Max, I can't recommend Isuzu. I'd strongly suggest that if you wanted a D-Max, if D-Max was it for you, buy a friggin' Mazda BT-50, dude, because Mazda is so much better at customer support than Isuzu. So there's that. Uh, Brody goes on to make these claims about the vehicle's almost four months old and they haven't been able to use it for its intended purpose. It's affecting our jobs and they've had to take time off to take this car back to the dealership to get the issue sorted out. To say nothing of the emotional energy that this kind of thing entails, right? Now, what I'd suggest, if you are in a position like Brody's, here's the general advice, right? You've got to go to the ACCC's website and you've got to read yourself up on consumer law because to get a refund, you've got to do a few things you've got to reject the vehicle and it has to be formally rejected. Okay, you have to communicate your rejection to them and don't do it face to face. Do it in writing by email. Use an email server. 
that never deletes the emails like Hotmail or Gmail, something like that, okay? So that you've got a record of your rejection because if push comes to shove, you're really going to need that rejection. That's a key part of the law. The other key part is the problem has to be a major failure, which they're probably claiming it's not, okay? The really interesting thing here, and I'm not a lawyer, but the interesting thing is that a succession of minor failures or the same failure over and over with the dealership unable to rectify it in a reasonable time equals a major failure in the context of the legislation. So what I would do is if you think you're in that position like the Brody Meister here, you've got to, the safest bet is if you're really not across this stuff, do the research, use a credible resource like the ACCC's website, which has a great deal of information. They've even got a dedicated PDF you can download, which is a guide to uh, retailers in the automotive industry about how they can conform to their consumer law obligations. But if you read that as a consumer, you will know what they're required to do and you'll know the various triggers for major and minor failures and things of that nature. Okay, so read that, read the general information about the consumer guarantees and all of that stuff, and then just do one thing that so many Australians seem to be philosophically opposed to doing, which is getting yourself and plonking yourself in front of just a half-decent local solicitor. You don't need to get some high-flying Denny Crane bigwig, right? Some corporate high-flyer for 5000 bucks an hour or something. Just the local dude, okay? And ask their advice about how to proceed because they will be able to sum up your situation. Take all the paperwork with you, okay? They'll be able to sum up your situation and say, okay, so you're entitled to this and here's what we need to do to get it. And then you, you know where... All of the troops are on the battlefield. You know where your allies are. You know where the enemy is and you know the terrain in between so you can define the battle space and figure out how to play it. This is something like everyone, every second person who communicates with me on this, they want me to do it for them for free or they want consumer affairs to do it for free and all of this stuff. They want it for free, okay? This sort of stuff doesn't happen for free. You made a bad choice. This is like marrying the wrong woman. I've had five ex-wives, okay? This is something I can speak about with some certainty. It's like marrying the wrong woman. You've got the wrong car. It's going to cost you something to get out of it. The only question is how much and what are you really entitled to and how should you play it? And I don't suggest that you go out and do this five times with five different Isuzus just so you end up stupendously good at playing this game. Like, don't do that, dude. Just acknowledge that this is a bad call and you need to get out of it. Your objective is to get a full refund and just find out how much that's going to cost you and then go and make it happen. Get the advice from your solicitor and act on it. Ask them questions about, well, what would it take for me to represent myself in consumer court? What documentation am I going to need? How should I play it? And if you're not capable of doing that, and like not everyone can talk underwater about what's inside a friggin' golf ball, okay, if you're not that guy, you're probably going to have to pay some advocate, some solicitor, to represent you in consumer court. You might need to go and get an expert report about this or that. The documentation you've got on the fault might be sufficient your own diary entries. You should always keep a diary, even if it's just a Word document, of contemporaneous notes about drop the vehicle off on this date, was told this on this date, got the vehicle back on that date, still not fixed, blah, blah, blah. Keep those records, okay? Contemporaneous notes, which means notes that you make shortly after something happens, They've got high evidentiary value in court, okay? And you can also send confirmation emails to the dealership. You could say, I got this vehicle back on this date and it's still not fixed. How are we going to move forward to fix that? So if they don't respond, right, they're going to look pretty shit in court 
They're going to look like they're not helping you. You should also send this to Isuzu's head office. And if they don't respond to you or they give you some bullshit generic response, then they're going to look like dicks in court. And trust me, this is the objective in court. When you go to court, make the other team look like a pack of card-carrying dicks, okay? Because then the judge is going to go, well, actually, you look like you've got your shit together and you look like you've got a legitimate complaint and they look like a bag of dry dicks and that's good for you dude so if i'm you and i'm in this position i've got some car they're not fixing it it's off the road for weeks and weeks and weeks it sounds to me like you've got a legitimate complaint and they're just stonewalling you because of this imbalance of power this is like you in your underwear with a little friggin pointy stick taking on the sons of friggin anarchy with a certain vengeful gleam in their eye and they're all packing you know glock 17s so there is this imbalance of power and they exploit that for all it's worth and what you've got to do is you've got to wage asymmetric warfare on them by having your shit together